This is the intro video for the PRISM Spectrometer Lab. There is another video that you should watch, probably even before watching this one, which is going to show you how to find the angle of minimum deviation for the spectral lines that we're going to be studying this week. You're going to need that angle of minimum deviation for your calculations, so I recommend that if you haven't watched that video yet, maybe stop and do so now. So, assuming that you have watched it, this is the spectrometer that we use in Richmond, and you'll notice that it looks a little different than the one in the other video. So let me just show you some of the differences. If you want to lock the telescope, this is the knob that will allow it to swing freely or be locked in place. What's confusing is that there's another knob here. This is the fine adjust. This will just rock the telescope back and forth very slightly, which can be useful if you're trying to get your crosshairs right on a spectral line but this will only adjust things if the telescope is locked. So when the telescope is unlocked, this knob actually doesn't do anything. To lock or unlock the table, that's this knob over here. So if I loosen this guy up, I can swivel my table, and if I tighten it up, then it's locked. In order to take readings off this apparatus, you're going to take them off of this little brass tab that moves along with the telescope. And this has got a vernier scale on it. If you need a refresher on how to read a vernier scale, there's an appendix in your lab manual that explains how to do this with pictures. What we're doing in this experiment is we're going to show that the index of refraction of a material, glass in this case, does depend on frequency. We say that glass, for example, has an index of refraction of about 1.6, but that's an average. If we put red light through here, we'll get a slightly different value than if we put blue light through. So we're going to show that in today's experiment. So we're going to need a bunch of very pure wavelengths of light to shine through our prism in this experiment, and where do we get those? Well, we could, for example, have a bunch of different lasers that shoot out different wavelengths of light, but that would make for a pretty expensive experiment. So we've got a different way. Over here, you've been given a helium discharge tube. So this tube has got helium gas in it, and we're going to electrically excite it, and that causes it to emit light. Now what's going on is that the electrons in the gas get excited from their ground state, the lowest energy state, to a higher state, and then they relax back down at some point. When they relax back down, they release the energy that they had absorbed before as light, but they can only release very specific wavelengths of light. So looking at this with a spectrometer, we're going to see a bunch of very distinct spectral lines rather than a continuous rainbow of color. So we can use those spectral lines as our sources of light that have very well-defined wavelengths. If you look in your lab manual on table one, they've given you six wavelengths for the brightest spectral lines of helium. Those are the six that you're going to be studying in this lab. For each of those wavelengths, you're going to calculate the index of refraction of the glass, and then later on you'll be able to show that yes, the index of refraction does change depending on the wavelength of light that's going through the glass. So before you begin taking data, you're going to need to focus all the different parts of your spectrometer properly. We're going to start by focusing the telescope. However, to focus the telescope, you're going to need to be able to point it out a window so you can look at some distant object, like a tree or the mountains. So you'll be invited to take your spectrometer into another room, prop it up on some boxes, and then point the telescope out the window. You should orient things like this so that the collimator is not going to be in your way and you don't want the prism here because you want the telescope to have an unobstructed view out the window. Once you've got it set up like this, then the first thing you're going to do is you're going to check that the crosshairs are in focus. So you should grab the little eyepiece and slide it in and out a little bit. And you'll see that the crosshairs go in and out of focus as you do that. So get them looking as dark and sharp as possible in your field of view and then you're going to focus the telescope itself, and you do that via this knob here. So if point the telescope at some distant object, like a tree, and then you adjust your focus knob here until the tree or the object looks in sharp focus. However, that may not actually be the correct focus exactly, so in order to get the best focus, you're going to next want to try to eliminate parallax. What that means is that you would look through your telescope, You'd wiggle your face back and forth a little bit, and you check whether the crosshairs and the distant object that you're looking at seem to be moving back and forth in sync when you move your face back and forth. So it shouldn't look like the crosshairs are moving more than the object, or the object's moving more than the crosshairs. I'm going to show you in the next part of the video exactly what I'm talking about. And by the way, once you've got your telescope in focus, you should not touch this knob again for the remainder of the experiment. Okay, this is unfortunately going to be a little bit hard to see, but I've got the camera pointed down the telescope right now, and you can see a tree upside down inside that black circle. 
You can also see the crosshairs on the telescope, so I'm going to move the telescope back and forth a little bit, and just you can see that the crosshairs move with the telescope, not with the tree. They're a little bit hard to see. The vertical one is probably the best one to focus on. If it looks like there's more than one horizontal line, that's because unfortunately I've got some power lines in there. So focus on that central vertical line of the crosshairs. I've got it sitting on top of the tree right now. And at this point, you will have adjusted the eyepiece such that your crosshairs look in sharp focus. And then you will have adjusted the knob on the side of your telescope to adjust the focus so that the tree itself also looks in focus. Now that may not be good enough, so this is the technique that you're supposed to use to get exactly the right focus. What you do is you wiggle your head back and forth. So I'm going to wiggle the camera back and forth, so you go back and forth a little bit, and what you should see when everything is perfectly focused is that the crosshairs and the tree don't seem to move relative to each other. So when you wiggle your head back and forth, the crosshairs and the tree seem to move back and forth in sync. If I focus this a little bit wrong, which I just did now, the tree may still look in focus to you, but when you wiggle back and forth, you're either going to see the line moving more than the tree or the tree moving more than the line. So right now that line, that vertical line is moving more than the tree does when I wiggle the camera back and forth. So that means I'm not quite at the right focus yet. If I go too far in the other direction, which I just did now, and wiggle the camera back and forth, now it looks like the tree is moving more than the line is. So when you've got things exactly focused, the line of the crosshairs and the tree, the distant background that you're looking at, are going to seem to move in sync. So again, I'll try and set that up. It's a little hard to do through the camera. And when I wiggle back and forth now, the tree and the line basically move in sync with one another. So that's the perfect focus. That's what you're trying to get. The last thing you want to focus is your collimator, so it's got a focusing knob as well. But in order to focus it, you need your light source. So take your spectrometer back to the lab, get it all set up, turn on your light source, and you want to look through the telescope with the telescope aligned with the collimator. So you're looking straight through towards the light source. Adjust your lamp back and forth so that the center line looks as bright as possible. And then you focus your collimator to make sure that that central line looks as in focus as possible. And as with the telescope, once you've got everything focused, you don't need to touch this knob again. So you leave this one and this one alone for the duration of the experiment. If your crosshairs get out of focus, however, you can adjust this just by sliding it in and out. You've been given a prism, and you'll notice that it's got two clear sides and one frosted side. So the corner that has the two clear sides, that should be right at the center of this black table in the middle. So there's actually lines inscribed on here, and you want to put that corner right at the center of the black platform. You also want a fairly steep angle here between this face and the collimator. So not the telescope, but the collimator should have a pretty steep angle with this one face of the prism. You will also notice that it's pretty easy for your prism to get knocked out of alignment. So on Richmond campus, we have these little brackets. So you can screw this into your platform, adjust prism so it's oriented correctly and then clip it in place with that little bracket and that'll make it a little more stable. Now if the little clip on that bracket is too high or oriented funny it's pretty uh, solid as is but if you want to move it around you just need to squeeze the clip and then it will slide around for you so you can adjust things up or down or twist the angle. At this point, you should be ready to take data. So you're going to use the technique that you learned in that other video for finding your angle of minimum deviation for all six wavelengths for helium gas. And then you're going to calculate the index of refraction for all of those six wavelengths. Now you'll notice that in the procedure of the lab manual, that's the last step that they list. For each spectral line, calculate the index of refraction of the flint glass. However, it's always a good idea to flip back to the objective for any experiment and use that to figure out what should go in your analysis for the experiment. So the objective for this experiment says A. Determine the indices of refraction of a glass prism for specific frequencies of helium light. And then there's B. Show that the index of refraction is different for different frequencies of light. So you'll want to figure out a way to do that. Now the most common way in science to figure out if things differ when you change a variable is to compare your values to see whether they agree with an uncertainty. You will find that your values are in some cases going to agree with an uncertainty.
So how do you show that the index of refraction changes? Well, I would suggest that a graph might be a good way to do that. So graph your data, and even if there is large uncertainties, you still might be able to see that there's a definite trend. However, I will warn you that it's not necessarily going to be a linear graph, so it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to use a linear graphing program like BlindGraph. You might want to do this by hand or use a more sophisticated program.